Um, we won't go very, very long, inshallah. Let me answer these questions that come to us with ikhtisar. Um, a brother brought to me just now on his Facebook, an Arab brother from the Jama'at in Jordan. There is a um, picture that is spreading around um, where there is a um, an iron-type container and inside of the container, there are some books that are burning. A lot of books are burning. And outside of the container, on the ground, are other books. And they are the books of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Rahimahullahu ta'ala. So the understanding of what's going on is in Jordan, from that picture, in Jordan, some of the people are burning the books of ibn Taymiyyah. And I think what they're trying to say is, they're burning those books because they are disgusted with the fatawa that the people have given in which they're saying these things came from the kalam of Ibn Taymiyyah. First thing, let me say is when it comes to these videos and pictures on the internet, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Don't be so quick to pass it off to the next person. Don't be so quick to believe it. In the UK a week ago, two weeks ago, there was a picture circulating of two Asians, two Pakistani men. They looked Pakistani. They had flowers, a bouquet of flowers, and they were holding each other. And it said that they were the first two same-sex marriage people in the UK from the Muslims. And um, this thing went around every place, everywhere. And they identified the city that they were from, a city called Blackburn, where there are a lot of Pakistanis. It's one of the biggest Pakistani communities in all of the UK. So when you get that and you see it, you're disgusted by it. You say, But now the Muslim has to ask himself, how do you know that's true? They can just be holding the bouquet for something else. They could have been at a marriage and they're taking the picture together. They can even be Sikhs, Hindu, you never know. So the point is, don't be so quick to believe everything. I gave a talk one time in our masjid, and I was telling the people about an incident in Syria where a little boy was running with his sister and some sniper was trying to shoot him. You people saw that video? And the little girl fell, and the little, the little boy played dead and then went and tr tried to run. It wasn't even real. So with the YouTube and all of that stuff, you can't believe everything. You can't believe everything. This thing about the man, the pilot who was burnt, when I saw it, he leaves things not to believe. Charlie Hebdo, the stuff I say, hey, if they would have shot him in his head, why his head didn't blow up? I mean, it's always those questions, and I'm not an Illuminati guy, you know, conspiracy theorist. But also, I will say, hey, that looks fishy, and I know how it goes. So that's the first thing. Second thing, Ikhwani, you should know, Let's say that it is really the books. They are the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and Shaykh al-Islam. First of all, we say you're not going to find anywhere in the books of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah where he said the permissibility of burning a captive Muslim or burning a human being is permissible just like that. You're not going to find it. These people have took, taken some shubahat from here and from there, and then they take some of his fatawa, made the tarkib of his fatawa for what they want to do. But you see how people will hate that imam because of what is attributed to him, and that is what happened to him in his lifetime. The enemies of Ibn Utaymi used to go to the leader, and he used to tell the leader, Ibn Utaymi, he believes this, he believes that, he's saying this, he's saying that, and he didn't even say those things, didn't even believe those things. And he kept putting him in prison, putting him in prison. And ultimately, he died in prison because of the iftira of the people, the lies of the people. And then, when he used to get out of the prison, one of his biggest enemies, who was responsible for putting him in the prison, when he died, his big enemy, he died. The students of Ibn Utaymi were happy. They rejoiced that the slave of Allah, who was his adu, had died. And one of them said that that was the khizyun of Allah. Ibn Utaymi said, don't say that, don't say that. And he went to the man's family, and he told his, the man's family, I'm responsible for you now. I'm responsible for you now. And that's because this is the way Ahl-Sunnah, this is the way the Muslim is supposed to exist with the other people, with Rahmah, 
It's supposed to exist with the people We're trying to understand. So everybody is not the same. People are doing things that are crazy, and it's just a case where we have to have better actions of how to deal with people. Okay, Juan, you could put your questions across. Inshallah, I'll get through this thing real quickly. What makes ISIS Khawarij? Is it the killing of people who oppose them or that they burnt them? Um, many, many of the descriptions that the Prophet gave about the Khawari Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are found in uh, ISIS, are found in Qaeda, they're found in the Shabab, they're found in Boko Haram. From them making takfir of the Muslims because the Muslim commits a major sin. That's one of the most important characteristics of the Khawarij. They kill the people of Al Islam and they make a taqarrub ila Allah by killing people in Islam, making permissible the blood. And one of the things about the Khawarij is, one of the things, sooner or later, the sword is coming out from the Khawarij and Shabab and Boko Haram and the Qaeda. That sword is coming out sooner or later. So they have a lot of characteristics. The way they think, our beloved country, Somalia, 22, 23 years, civil war. The last thing that that place needs are a group of people who don't understand how to weigh the harms and the benefits. Hey, stop fighting. We're trying to move forward. We've been... We blasted our country back 40, 50 years now, 100 years. We're trying to move forward, and we have a lot of uh, challenges. We don't need a group of people coming out, keeping us preoccupied with murder, keeping us preoccupied with making the West more upset with us, where they can play games with our community, our country. So there are a lot of uh, characteristics of the Khawarij. We don't want anyone to sit there and think, well, it's the Khawarij, ISIS, just to be against the ISIS. Not like that. We're not like that at all. As we mentioned today, I don't think after the thing what happened today or recently, anybody should have any doubt about this situation. You mentioned that ISIS used the fatwa from Ibn Utaymiyyah regarding burning uh, an enemy to strike fear in them. Is this valid? Could it be valid if the pilot was not a Muslim? It's not valid because even if Ibn Utaymiyyah took that opinion, which he didn't, even if he said it was permissible, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't burn. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, don't mutilate. So if any person comes and says with his ijtihad, opposite of what the Quran and the Sunnah said, we're going to reject their statement with respect. We're going to reject their statements. So Ibn Utaym is a human being. So he has some fatawa that he's been criticized for. There's a fatawa, Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, that if a man divorces his wife, the point is every person makes mistakes. Everybody. And Ibn Taymiyyah is a person who made some mistakes with his ijtihad. But he's a scholar. He'll get re one reward if he gets it wrong, and he'll get two if he gets it right. So that it, he, he, he didn't say this was permissible. What if the Nia was pure for Allah? Are they still the Khawarij? Ikhwani, the Khawarij were some really sincere people. The first Khawarij was sincere. And the Prophet told his companions, not us, he told his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yahkiru ahadukum salatuhu ma salatihim, wa siyamuhu ma siyamihim, yakra'un al Quran, wa la yujawiz, hanajiruhum. If you companions were to compare yourselves to them, you will look at your salat as being small and your fast and being small. They read the Quran and they don't know what they're doing. Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he went to debate with them, he saw those people praying. He saw on their heads big black marks. He saw on their fingers calluses, on their knees calluses. He said, when I went there, I can hear the buzzing of a dhikr. Those people were, those people had ibadah back then. So they have a level of sincerity, but with the sincerity, you have to have the sunnah. Abdullah ibn Khabbab, his father was one of those companions who was weak and oppressed during the time of Mecca. Khabbab, he's a tremendous companion who has sabr fi sabirillah. The Khawarij killed his son, Abdullah, while he was traveling, along with his wife, who was pregnant. 
And when they caught them traveling, they tried to make him get on their side. He, he didn't agree. He was not muqtani with what they were saying. They killed him. And then they killed his wife, took her baby out of her womb, and cut the baby's neck. They killed the son of the companion, killed his innocent wife who was pregnant, cut the baby open, and then and killed the baby again. And then as they were traveling more, one of them took practice with the arrow, and he shot an animal of a dhimmi, a non-Muslim who was under the protection of the Muslims, living with the Muslims. He shot an animal, killed him. The other people said, what are you doing? You can't do that. You killed the man's property. They spent half of the day looking for the owner to pay him his money. That's sincerity. But here you kill and you shed the blood of a Muslim who the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَزَوَالُ الدُّنْيَا أَحْمُنُ عَلَى اللَّهِ عَزُّ وَجَلُ مِنْ قَتْلِ مِنْ قَتْلِ مُسْلِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقْ For the whole dunya to go away, anybody here, for the whole dunya to be destroyed is easier, lighter on Allah, than for a Muslim to be killed without any right. You're talking about the blood of the sheep and the blood of this person you didn't care about? The blood of this person, the Khawarij, with Hussein. They're asking Abdullah ibn Abbas about hitting the fly at Hajj when you have ihrama. You hit a mosquito or a fly and the blood comes out. He says, did I have to pay the fidya? Is this a, is this a mistake? I, I killed the fly and it got blood. Ibn Abbas said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Iraq. We're from Iraq. He said, you people chopped off the head of the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu you spilled his blood, and you asked me about the blood of a fly? So they have some sincerity, but it's not enough to be sincere. Seeing in the halaqa, making dhikr, and then that halaqa turns into source where you can Sincerity is not enough in our religion. The brother asked me this question, I think, what is the difference between ghulu and khawarij? Anybody can have ghulu. Ghulu comes from the word ghala, uh, um, to be like uh, expensive or, you know, to go overboard. That's ghulu, to be extravagant, to go overboard. Oh, Ahlul Kitab, don't have ghulu in your religion. Only say the truth. Al-Masih ibn Maryam is Rasulullah, the kalim of Allah, and the ruh that Allah gave to Maryam. So the khawarij have ghulu. But every person who has ghulu is not khawarij. You have some Salafi people who have ghulu. They make tabdi of everybody who doesn't agree with them. They have ghulu, but they're not khawarij. Some Sufis have ghulu. Some Brawis have ghulu. Some people on Hanafi Madhab and the Madhahib, they have ghulu, but they're not from the khawarij. So ghulu, the ghulat, people go to extreme extremisms. They go overboard, whereas the khawarij are something else altogether. This person said here, what would you say to the argument that King Abdullah and Saudi and others are spending money to support the killing of innocent Muslims in Egypt and in other places? It may be true. It may be true. Well, by then, it may be true. What's the issue now? It may be true. And do I agree with every foreign policy of King Abdullah and Saudi Arabia? Uh, my example, your example, is not King Abdullah and Saudi Arabia and the government of Saudi Arabia. People have glue against Saudi Arabia because a lot of it is hasid. A lot of it is hasid. Allah gave the Arabs in that part of the world money. So a lot of people have hasid against them, a lot. And some people really just don't know the vulm. They just don't like the vulm. Some people just don't like the vulm. But where's the justice? Where's the justice? First thing is what Allah mentioned in the Quran, We made some oppressors over other oppressors because of what they used to do. We're going to get rulers like us. So if someone's going to sit there and talk about King Abdullah and giving money to the kuffar to kill Muslims and stuff like that, what about us sitting here? We have people sitting here, some people drink hummus, some people smoke weed, some people, they don't, they abandon their children. Some people sitting right here, they gamble. You know, Muslims, I'm not saying anyone here. Some Muslims, some Muslims, they don't respect their mother and father. Some people are into pornography. Some people beat their wives. Some people, the wife is having a relationship over here. Some people, his own mother and father are not praying and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and you're busy with King Abdullah. 
Now I ask all of you with all sincerity, all sincerity, I ask you. I grew up in America and I kind of have something. You know how we are. There was racism the, when I grew up. So I didn't like the establishment. I didn't like the government. I, I love America. The country is a beautiful place. Florida, California, uh, the Grand Canyon, Seattle, Washington, the food you can get all over that place. I love America. I don't like the government. I think the government is hypocritical and oppressive. They're real terrorists, in my opinion. But with that, with, with, with that reality, with that reality, with that reality, I say, where's the seriousness about how we're judging these issues? Where's the seriousness? So we've been placed in this situation because of our own deeds. Al Hassan al Basri used to tell the people who came to complain against the leader of his time, he used to say, Don't take the sword to go and fight those people. Don't take the sword to go and fight them people because Allah put them over us because of how we are, the way we are. So the guy actually thinks when you say something like that, you know, there is ghulu in some Saudi Arabia. Some people believe everything in Saudi Arabia is salafia. No, that's not true. Everything in Saudi Arabia is Islam. That's not true. Just be fair and just. How many of you people made Umrah? How many of you people made Hajj? Put your hand up if you made Umrah and Hajj. Ah, that's the majority of you. When you go to Umrah and Hajj, does your Iman not go up? And while you're there for those two weeks, you're like, wow, there's I. And then when you, as soon as you hit the airport back here, your Iman stops going down. Who's going to make inkar of that? Who's going to make inkar of that? So that Saudi Arabian regime, they did some good things, and they did some bad things, and they continue to do some good things, continue to do some bad things. Why do we get mixed up in all of that stuff? And then another thing that's really weird, Ikhwani, is the people who hate Saudi Arabia like that is ghulu. You have ghulu. You, they hate Saudi Arabia for hasad. Hasad. We, we, they, they help the kuffar in their foreign policy. That may happen. But what about us? There are people spying on each other. There are people ratting each other out, making stuff up about people in the community. There are people who pay money for kuffar before they give any money to the Muslims. What about us? So anyway, anyway, when it's time for Ramadan, when it's time for Ramadan, where I come from, I'm living in Birmingham, we never, ever, 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 ever fast on the same day or break our fast on the same day because there's some people who, whatever Saudi Arabia say, they're going to go against it. So if Saudi Arabia say Monday, they're going to do it Tuesday, and sometimes Wednesday, and sometimes Thursday. The Muslims are in Hajj and Arafat, and they're doing some other stuff. So they don't believe, they actually think that the scholars of Saudi Arabia and the government, they just sit there and make stuff up. The moon was sighted, and they just made it up while they were gambling. But, but, when you do something of the Sunnah, like you pray in your shoes, for an example, not in the masjid, but somewhere. If in the month of Ramadan, in your masjid, you want to do 11 rakat, which is the sunnah for taraweeh, they say, but Saudi Arabia doesn't do that. Now Saudi Arabia is a dalil. Now Saudi Arabia is a hujjah now. And that goes to show Ikhwani the lack of sincerity. So the Muslim has to be balanced. Our prophet, our nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa was a balanced person. If you're going to blame King Abdullah, first of all, you're wasting your time. Allah's rahmah is wasi'a. King Abdullah is under the Mashi'a of Allah. Allah Azza wa may put him in the Jannah without any adab, without any hisab. And Allah may put all of us in the hellfire. The prostitute lady, Akramakumullah, went to Jannah because of some water. That man gave Zamzam water to the people, whatever he did. You don't know, I don't know how Allah is going to judge those issues. So relax and don't busy yourself with something like that. But no, we have wala wa bara, and we hate what Allah hates and love what Allah loves. So if someone is doing something that's against the religion, we don't like it. We have to hate it. But now the issue is how we're going to deal with it. What is the brief explanation of Salafi and Salafi? Can you answer this last to close out if you wish? Salafi is easier than making this the last question. Salafi is just simply following the Quran and the Sunnah the way the righteous predecessors followed the Quran and the Sunnah, those companions. May Allah be pleased with them. It's that simple. It is al-Islam, al-Musaffa, pure Islam. The scholars of the past called it Salafiyyah. 
as Salafia is Islam, it's all of Islam, and it's the truth. But the people who call themselves Salafi, Abu Usama, I'm not the best human being, nor do I practice everything in Islam. And all of the Salafis in the world together don't. And you don't have to, you don't have to be with a group of people who call themselves Salafi. But you have to take that Quran and the Sunnah and say, I'm going to practice and understand it the way the companions did. Daesh doesn't do that. Many Sufis don't do that. Many people from Khwan Muslimin don't do that. Many people from Jamaat Tablik don't do that. Many Brawis do your Bundis. They don't do that. The Muslim Tawaif, we're not doing that. But which each one of those groups, even with the Rafida, the Rafida will curse the companions. They have some of Islam. What they have is love and Ahlul Bayt. We love Ahlul Bayt. They just do it the wrong way. But that is something from our religion. So what Salafi Ikhwani is a concept. It's not what people are projecting it to be. And unfortunately now, we have Salafi Jihadis. It's an oxymoron. What's that, Salafi Jihadis? Person who's Salafi, but he'll blow you up. You know what that came from? That came from the behavior of some people who are not practicing Jihad correctly in this religion. They put themselves before the scholars of Al-Islam. They put themselves before the scholars of Islam. He said here, or this person said right here, where do we stand on a person volun voluntary playing plain himself? If I'm protecting the government policy, is this permissible? And uh, can't really make that out, guys. Sorry about that. Um, can you compare the events of 1400 all in Mecca where over 3,000 people died in the takeover of the Haram with events that are occurring today? Um, I think this person is talking about in 1400. Fourteen was Juhayman at that time? Juhayman was seven, was... Uh, 1976, right? 79. The people who took over the Kaaba, Ikhwani, they had some Khariji stuff in them. They called themselves Salafi people. Juhayman and those people with him, they were spreading the Sunnah and Tawheed and Dawah throughout the Arabian Peninsula and throughout uh, Al Yemen. And they were on the Sunnah. And they were traveling all over the place giving Dawah. And they were Salafi. And they were supported by the big scholars of Saudi Arabia at that time, they were supported by them. Some of our big scholars were even with them in some ways, like a Sheikh Muqbil. He was with that group of people. But when this thing started coming, that Juhay Man's brother-in-law was the Mahdi and so forth and so on, they had inhiraf. And then the scholars started saying, hey, what are you doing? Stop, what are you doing? And al Albani, people were warning them, what are you doing, what are you doing? And then it led them to ultimately kill people at the Kaaba. And they were Salafi people. But they were youngsters of a Salafia. The scholars are telling them, don't do that. And they're saying, no, you don't know. We have some Shubahat. The man's name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he's from the Qahtani tribe. So he has to be the Mahdi. They had some stuff going on with him. And ultimately, it led to the fiasco that happened. So they had Khariji characteristics. But they didn't make takfir of the people. But they made the people's blood halal and they killed people at the Kaaba. Sacrilegious. That's ilhad. They were against the scholars. That's one of the characteristics of the Khawarij. They don't stay with the main body of the Muslims. That person is saying here right now, are you saying ISIS is the Khawarij? How do we know for certain that they are? Just because we see it in the media um, how do we verify these videos are real? ISIS honestly came out of where, where did it come from within the past year? It's very fishy. And um, these videos of these killings and the, these other things, they're just saying that this is a very fishy situation. And the way the video, the validity of it is really weird. How do we know? Real simple, Ikhwani, as we told you before, don't believe everything that you see. I told you when I saw that video, I said, no, I don't, I don't believe that stuff. I mean, you have to be skeptical now during the time that the Prophet described Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as sanawat khada'at. These are times of deceit. I mean, there was a long time if a person were to argue they didn't go to the moon. 
They didn't go to the moon. If a person took that position, I'm not going to argue with them because I wasn't there when they said they went to the moon. And when you look at that moon footage, how the flag is waving and there's no oxygen and no wind on the moon, it leaves your mind to say, hey, man, that's not the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, the Quran and the Sunnah, I got to believe all of that. I know that there's a man, his name was Dhurqar Naim, and I know that there's Yat Juj and Mat Juj, and there's somewhere in the earth. And although I can't find that stuff, I have to believe it, because that's Wahyun from the Sema. As for you into the moon, I, I, I could discuss that with you. I could disagree with that. And if the person said that, he's free. He's free. So with what's going on today, we take these news reports with a grain of salt. But they're indisputable evidence. Do you not know that the marja, the people, the khawarij, who ISIS go to, they refuted them. They're refuting them. Their own, their own sheikhs, Abu Muhammad al-Maqdasi, Abu Qatada. And they're not from the ulama of al-Islam. They're from the ulama who gave, they're from the people who gave fatawa that made fitna in Al-Jazair and all over the place, in the UK. Fitna. Now, those people had enough sense to come right now and to say, hey, you people are astray. Their own people saying you are astray. And you know what the people used to tell us in the past, Ikhwani? Some of our younger brothers, reverts, who we disagree with, like over there in the UK, there's a group called, there's a group called they have a leader there who's always representing Islam and he's extremely irresponsible. His name is Anjum Chowdhury. They always give him the mic and he's always saying inflammatory, incendiary things. The people, they want to celebrate Memorial Day, the day that their people got killed. So they want to celebrate that day. I don't agree with we should celebrate that day. I think it's hypocritical. I think it's vul. But for you to come and say, the poppy seed and to burn the poppy seed and to throw eggs at the... That you can't do that. You can't do that. Anyway, Ikhwani, they used to say to us that the real ulama, the ulama of jihad, the real ulama, the ulama who are in the prison, the real ulama, the ulama who are in the maidan of al-jihad, the real ulama, the real... Meaning those people who they believe in. Now, those people came out against ISIS, their real ulama came out, and that's still not enough proof for them to lead these people. So there are indisputable facts, proofs from their own people. This thing is real. Nusra is killing ISIS. ISIS is killing Nusra. People are dying. People are losing their lives. Our kids, our kids are going over there. The father goes after his kid. And people are getting shot. So you don't come with that other extreme. It's all imaginary. This is just a figment of the imagination. The, the, the government concocted this, the media. That's crazy. The government is allowed, the media is allowed to take advantage of the confusion. And they do take advantage of it. When those people killed those kids in Afghanistan, I say, hey, who would do that? In Pakistan, who would do that? Okay, they said it was the Taliban. Okay, the Taliban, I have my issues with the Taliban. I have my issues with the Taliban. But you got to know they're a different kind of Taliban. Three types of Taliban. That Taliban that did that, this, I say, yeah, 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 maybe, maybe not. You never know. You can't just condemn people because you don't like them. You don't like their men. You can't do that. Boko Haram. They still have 200 girls in the, in the jungle. 200 girls in the jungle for the last four, five, six months. All of the north of Nigeria is being destroyed. I saw a picture on the news of the airport in Ukraine. What's that city where they're fighting? What is it called? They showed it when it was built two years ago. It was nice and beautiful. They showed it now. It's all black and destroyed from the top. Northern Nigeria is all like that. You mean to tell me that people are really running around and you're not doing anything about it? No, we can't believe everything. But ISIS is real, Ikhwani, unfortunately. It's realer than what we um, wish it was. A person named uh, Imran Nazar Hussein has been supporting the actions of Bashar al-Assad and has been refuting the people of Syria for fighting against him. What should be our course of action against this so -called, these so-called sheikhs? There was a sheikh from Syria his name was Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al-Bulti. 
who was blown up in a masjid. And he used to give fatwa in support of the regime of Syria. He lost his life as a result. Booty, he died. And the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tasubbu alamwat. Don't curse. Don't talk about people who died. Because they went forward to get what they're going to get. al Buti, King Abdullah, they went forward. I don't like what the man did. I don't like the man's position in supporting Bashar. I don't like that. But to talk bad about those people, what's the benefit? What's the fa'idah that's going to come out of that? So we say in general, Ikhwani, anyone who supports ISIS after seeing them burn a man alive, something's wrong with you. You have to get your head checked. You have to check your Islam. Similar, anyone who supports Bashar Asad, knowing his aqidah, knowing what he believes, knowing the aqidah of the Alawiyin and what they believe, his politics in the area. That guy doesn't mean any good for Islam. And Syria has always been a very important place for the Muslim world, always. So anybody who supports that uh, is a bit of a problem. Some people's beard. From the ISIS to the beard. Some people's beard is longer than their good deeds. What do you say about these people, please? Ikhwani, <laughs> this brother over here, his issue is his beard. And this brother over here, his issue is his pants are not being worn the right way. This person over here, his issue is he smokes cigarettes. This person over here, his issue is he can't lower his gaze. And that one over here, he has riba. And that one over here, he's doing this, does that. And everybody, that's our situation. So don't be judgmental like that in the first place. But instead of looking at that person, look at your own self. Look at your own self, what you're doing, what you're not doing. Today was Salatul Fajr on Friday. Did you pray the Fajr? Did you pray? Did you come to the Juma today? Did you come to the Juma? The five prayers of today. Did you do it? Your relationship with your mother. Don't you know that? Your mother and your father. If, if there was anything that would destroy these quicker than anything else, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it would be a person doing bad to his parents and his mother and his father. So I'm looking at this guy over here with his beard. Although I think you shouldn't cut your beard. Other than if you're going to make Umar or Hajj, you have a long beard, you could cut it from here. But Abdullah ibn Abbas was of the opinion that a man could trim his beard down. He was of that opinion. And he used Dalil from the Quran for that. I don't agree with Abdullah ibn Abbas in that particular issue. And there were scholars who took that position. There were scholars who took that position. So you're talking about the beard, but over here, over here, what you're doing is something that there's no ikhtilaf in. There's no doubt that if you're bad to your parents, you're making a big crime and sin. There's no ikhtilaf in that. So I think we have to uh, put these things in their proper place and we have to... Uh, um, Busy ourselves with our own deeds. That's what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, during the time of al-fitna, go into your house and cry because of your own situation. Your own situation. Hey, Ikhwani, I ask brothers from Pakistan all the time, hey, if Allah bless you, he's a razak, if he gave you 10 million pounds, not dollars, 10 million pounds, cash money, would you go back to Pakistan and live? Most of them say, no, I'm not going back there. Because my children are born here, and they understand here. And also the society has problems. That's the case for most of us. So why am I saying that? I'm saying that to say a man who's married with children, he has more than enough on his plate to be dealing with his own situation, as opposed to be looking at somebody and, and, and measuring his beard. He has, more, he has so much to deal with, his wife, his mother, his father, sending money back to his people, his sister who's divorced, his sister who's raising her children by herself. He, he has so much that he's dealing with. Where in the world does he find the time and the desire to talk about so-and-so and so-and-so? Where does he get the fudul of the waqt? Where, where, where does it come from? Anyway, he said, how do you deal with a corrupt ruler like Bashar? Is force not necessary? You know, that issue is easy in theory, and that is Al-Bashar. Bashar shouldn't be the ruler of the Muslims because of his beliefs and what he is. But the Muslims don't have the ability to do anything about it. And before this fitna, Khwani, I don't know if you knew it or not, but Syria was a place five, ten, ten years ago. Bashar didn't stop anybody from praying. 
You can go to Syria and you can make hijrah to Syria. Somalis, Somalis, Somalis. Some of them chose to come to Europe because of the fitting in their country. Others went to Syria and they learned in Arabic and their kids are growing up speaking Arabic and they were living in Syria and Egypt. Syria was a country, it was stable. If you compare it to many other like countries in Africa and other third world countries, Syria is a beautiful place and Bashar wasn't making problems for people. He had some secret service people who were watching you. He had that. But he wasn't stopping people from fasting in the month of Ramadan. So when he was ruling before this time, you can live in Syria and you can be mukarram and your life can be okay. But now the dunya has changed. So when we talk about should he be the leader, what should we do? This is not the time for that discussion. What should we do with Syria right now? You know, Akhwani, Imam al-Awza'i, who came from that area of Beirut, I was always impressed with him. I always wanted to go to Syria. I didn't go to Syria. I see right now the footage on the TV about Syria and the dimar and tadmir of that place. And it's like something in your dream. The way they destroyed that country. The way it's destroyed. Damascus. And that just is just destroyed. And now we're going to talk about Bashar as the ruler. What should we do? Is there such is there such as weighing the good and bad in Islam, like ISIS? I mean, I don't understand that, weighing the good and the bad. There is a thing of weighing good and bad. The Masali and the Mafasid. I wanted to tell you about a fatwa of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah that he was criticized for in fiqh about talaq and the idda of the woman. But I weigh the situation, and it's not good to say that. He made a mistake. Like Al-Imam Abu Hanifa said in the particular issue. Like Al-Imam Madik said in another position. Like Al-Imam, whoever said it, whatever, that's how it goes. So you got to wait. Is it going to be beneficial? Is it going to be harmful? How could it be used? How could it be understood? Weighing the pros and the cons is important in our religion. We have these last three questions, and we're out of here, inshallah. I think they're saying, what are all the descriptions of the munafiqeen? Because I fear for myself to be amongst these uh, people. And what should I do? There's a nifaq that push you outside of Islam. And then there's the nifaq hypocrisy of actions. Many people have the uh, characteristics of the munafiqeen. But it doesn't make them people who are truly munafiqeen. Make dua to Allah and just try your best to stay away from those things like many of the things that uh, we have mentioned already. Can you please name the seven who are shaheed? Other than the mujahideen, the one who is killed by the fire, the lady who dies while giving birth, the person who was drowned, the individual who dies from a plague, bubonic plague, a bo Ebola, this stuff like that. The person who had a stomach ailment. The person who the wall fell on them. And there's one more. I think I mentioned the drown. Huh? Have the seven? Testine. I think I said that. So those, those, those are the uh, seven. And again, Ikhwani, for the people who don't have rahma. That's the rahmah of Allah and the people. That's the rahmah of Allah and the people. That a person gets the reward of the mujahideen because of something that happened to him. He didn't have anything to do with it. He didn't have anything to do with, you know, he fell in the water and he drowned. The tsunami came and he drowned. Now he was trying to get away. But he gets the reward of the tsunami. So the reward of the shaheed. So if a person were to look at all of these texts of the Quran and the sunnah, the descriptions of Allah, the ahkam of Al-Islam, he knows. Don't give up hope by the rahmah of Allah. Don't look at our religion as a religion where Allah wants to make things difficult and tough for us. And our Lord is like, no, our Lord is gentle, he's latif, he's merciful, he's halim. Just relax. That person said, is the hadith about the one who dies on Friday will not have the punishment of the grave, an authentic hadith, and if so, 
Which book? That's a good question because the hadith about the person who dies on Friday night or on Friday, he will be protected from the adab of the qabr. All of those hadith are da'if. All of the single narrations are da'if. Something's wrong with all of them. But when you put them all together, they strengthen each other and they become a hadith that is hasan. And that was the rule of Ibn Hajar. That's the rule of Al-Albani as well. He brings a statement of those scholars, Sakhawi. So if you go back, for those of you who have this book and it is present, like Jibali's book, Al-Albani's book, Ahkam al Janais, it's in there. The signs of a good death. Al-Jibali about funerals. The signs of a good death. You go back there and you'll see that the hadith is authentic. And for your information, FYI, FYI, FBI, CIA, MBA, NBA, CBS. For your information, if we give a talk and we use a hadith, we think that it's authentic. We think and we believe that it's authentic. So anytime you see us using a hadith, if we don't tell you that it's not authentic, then you should understand that I'm thinking that it is authentic. It's possible that I'm using a hadith that you may think is not authentic. So you can always come to me and say, hey, you know that hadith you use? I don't agree. I think it's not authentic. Then we have a discussion. But generally speaking, a salafia is using the hadith that are authentic and avoiding the hadith that are weak. And if you use a hadith that is weak, when it's weak, you should tell the people that it's weak. You should let them know. You should let them know. So that's just for the person who's asking me a question. You know that hadith you used, is it authentic? You don't have to ask that question. If I use a hadith, it's because I think it's authentic. If any of you, even the little man right here, the little man, what's your name, little man? Mas'ud. Abdullah and this little guy behind Mas'ud. Ansarullah. If Ansarullah, Mas'ud, Abdullah, they learned that a hadith that I used was wrong, they can come to me, Mas'ud, and say, Akhi, Abu Usama, listen, uh, I read that that hadith was wrong. I said, oh, yeah, Mas'ud, who told you that? Will you get that? He said, well, I saw it over here and just says, ah, it's okay, I'm going to check it out. And then in the next dar, so the next khutbah, we're going to come and say, hey, we used that hadith, it was not right. The Prophet didn't say that. Last question, Ikhwani. Today the ummah is divided. And there is catastrophic things happening all around the globe, occurring. Uh, our countries and our resources, our youth are fighting each other. So what is the best solution to bring those divided, this divided ummah together? And yes, to uh, something about hope and Islam back to our lives. In terms of unity, we'll never be united except by that which united the companions. And the companions were like us as well. Their society was like us as well. Where division is something that's natural. People don't want to be. People have a propensity where everybody's going to do his own thing. Birds of a feather flock together. Look at our community right here. Everybody is different. The diversity of Islam is everybody is different. I'm a revert African-American person. I'm giving a talk. Arab person is not giving the talk right now. In the audience, we have all kinds of people. What helps us to be united are the things that the Prophet brought, because his companions were like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radhi Allah anhu Them Arabs were racist amongst themselves, and they were not united with their tribalism. And the non-Arabs were dealt with a particular way, and they were also divided amongst themselves. But the Nabi brought a religion where the people are praying together, people are worshiping the same God, the people, the same ilah, the people have been told, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, in the way of bringing about unity. And there are a lot of things, a lot of issues. But it's not complete, and it won't happen by empty slogans, but it comes with practicing the religion, those things that he told us to do. Like, like loving for your brother what you love for yourself. Like the hadith, the Muslim who mixes with the people and he's patient with them is better than the one who doesn't mix with them. So you should mix with the people. Like the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you sit in places like this, then come together because that'll cause your hearts to be together. Like those hadith where he said, give gifts and it will force the love between yourselves. Like when we pray, he said, 
come together, put your feet together, and, 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 and pray like a solid cemented structure. So there are many things that we can do. Like the Arab doesn't have any virtues over the non-Arab, and the non-Arab over the Arab. All of you are brothers, and all of you come from Adam. Adam was created from the dirt. So all of those things that we see and we saw taking place with the companions who were like us, diversified, and they were different. And that's the beauty of our religion. The Prophet Muhammad, when he comes Yom Al-Qiyamah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't fail in relaying the message. He, shows, he showed us the blueprint. Just for us, inshallah, to grab the bull by the horns. And <laughs> okay, Ikhwani, we again want to thank all of you, and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to uh, accept it and to bless all of you for your good listening, for your sabr as well. I'm kind of surprised, I'm kind of shocked, because these types of topics, they usually cause something. There's someone in the community who he jumps up and he says something. That happened in the past. And I was prepared. I was prepared if that was going to happen today. But this is the adab of Abu Huraira's masjid, mashallah. This is the adab with all of your diversity. With all of the diversity and the different levels that people are on Islamically in different groups. So the call is this masjid has to call to the kitab and the sunnah and call the people to going back to the original, the original blueprint. That was left for us by the Prophet and his companions, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Does anyone have Ukasha from Ghana's telephone number? <laughs> Ukasha, who used to come here. Anybody got his number? Does anybody have Bilal Phillips' email address? Anybody have that? 